Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Mantel, the core topic leader for freelancing at AHCJ. This webinar is one in a series of topic-specific training opportunities for health journalists. Today, we're discussing how to become a ghostwriter or a collaborator on books. Many freelance journalists are curious about expanding beyond articles and into books, specifically writing with an expert, but they may not know how to break into this kind of work. So joining us today are literary agent Madeline Morell and writer Susan Gallant. Madeline is the founder and owner of 2M Communications, which is an agency that represents um, professional ghostwriters, collaborators, and editors who specialize in books. She's kind of a matchmaker. She works with other literary agents and publishers whose authors, whether that's a scientist or a physician or a celebrity, require ghostwriters and collaborators to turn their thoughts and ideas into a book. Um, her agency has provided writers for more than 60 New York Times bestsellers, and uh, the authors uh, that her agency collaborates with come from a bunch of different fields, health and fitness, medicine, psychology, parenting, science, business, film, and, and many more. Susan Golan has written more than 50 nonfiction books either alone or with others. She's written three books with former First Lady Rosalind Carter, uh, including With On Our Reach, Ending the Mental Health Crisis. She uh, wears many hats. Susan is a book collaborator, co-author, ghostwriter, book doctor, editor, and writing coach. Uh, she specializes in psychology, health and medical breakthroughs, diet, women's advancement, business, spirituality, and parenting. And she taught writing at UCLA's Writers Program for nearly 20 years. I'm going to start the questions off. Uh, viewers can ask questions at any time by typing them into the Q&A space. Please don't use the chat function, use the Q&A space, and I'll direct your questions to our panelists. I'm, I'm going to start with a pretty basic question. Uh, what is the difference between ghostwriting and collaborating? Um, Madeline, do you want to take that? Sure. I think it's semantics, frankly. Um, I think of late people seem to prefer the, the word collaborator, but I don't think it really makes any difference. Uh, collaborator, ghostwriter, it's, it's one and the same, in my mind anyway. Susan? Well, I think the difference is that for a ghostwriter doesn't get credit, whereas a collaborator would. So, uh, and I can give you an example where I agreed to ghostwrite Rosalind Carter's first book with her. I had never agreed to that before. And uh, unfortunately my phone is ringing <laughs> uh, because I wanted to have my name on the cover. I partly ego and partly because I needed it for future work. So if I can get rid of this, I'm so sorry. No problem, that's okay. We live in a busy world here. Um, a collaborator uh, gets. I had been a collaborator earlier, and my name was in all of the on all of the books that I had written before, because I felt I needed it to advance my career, and also I think my ego needed it. I just felt like I've done all this work, and I'm not getting any credit. I hate that. So, <laughs> so, uh, but then Rosalind Carter's first book came along, and my agent said, "Well, she wants a ghostwriter for this one. She doesn't want anybody else on the cover." And I did want to work with her so much that I said, okay, I'll agree to that. But at the end, when the book jacket arrived at her office, uh, she called me and she said, you know, I think the publisher made a mistake. They left your name off the book. She, so she actually transformed me for, for her books from a ghostwriter to a collaborator. Wonderful. So it's the same process. Madeline's right. It's the, sa it's the same work. Well, that's it, what I'm going to ask. It, 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 Within the business, within the industry, when I'm talking to uh, agents and editors, which I do all day long, we throw around the word ghostwriter, collaborator, interchange. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and, and it's the same work that you're doing. I beg your pardon? It's the same work that you're doing. You're writing. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think it specifically means that a, a, a ghostwriter and or a collaborator is going to get cover credit. That's something that is uh -huh. specified. But, the, but the, you know, collaborator, to my mind, does not automatically mean. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, just to add a little more complexity, is there a difference between collaborator and co-author? Yes. 
there, there I, I, I agree with Susan. Co-author, yes, gets gets uh, a with credit, and sometimes a co-author can can get an and credit. I mean, it's much more of a a partnership basis. In almost every instance, um, copyright is still the authors. I mean, there are occasions when copyright is shared, but uh, if you're talking about co-author, yes, then you're definitely talking cover credit and sometimes an and credit rather than a with credit. What what do, I mean, what does a ghostwriter or a collaborator, uh, what do they do? They write the whole book? Um, they interview the author, the or you know the expert who's going to be the author or the celebrity. Susan, yeah. So let me talk process a little bit. Um, it's a very different behavior than what a journalist would do, first of all, because a, a co-author, collaborator, ghostwriter, whatever you are, you're getting into the head of the expert you're working with. You want to see the world through their eyes. You need to understand their point of view. You're not challenging them in particular unless you actually feel like they are, um, you know, contradicting themselves. Hey, in chapter two you said this, and in chapter four you're saying that. It doesn't make sense. That kind of stuff. But you you try to get within their world and try to understand so that you can write with their voice. And that's the whole point: is that the books need to sound like them. They don't should not sound like you. So you know, as far as ego investment, mine has always been in. Does it read well? Is it is it uh, easy to understand? Is it exciting? To, you know, are there good stories in there that people will want to follow versus the content of the science or the, you know, I rely on the expert to bring the science and uh, that can happen or what, whatever the material is, the content, it can come in many different ways. So, uh, you know, some people have papers they've written that they want to give you and, and speeches they've given. And sometimes I do a big brain dump with somebody. I'll spend a long weekend with them and we'll just disgorge everything they want to have in the book. And I'm taking wild and crazy notes. And then we come back and we put together a book proposal to sell. Uh, with Rosalind Carter, I spent time at the Carter Center. I went through her file. She gave me access to everything, uh, you know, things she's written, speeches, letters she had received. Of course, the copyright for the letters belonged to the letter writers, I later found out, <laughs> to get their permission. Um, so it's really a, a wide range, uh, and it really, every book is different. It depends on how the person comes to you and what they have. Um, but the most important thing, I think, is for the writer, collaborator, ghostwriter to have a passion for the subject, because you're going to spend at least a year on this book, and if you're just doing it for money, you can forget about it. To me, that's like being a whore. You know, you're paying me for my brain. Uh, versus my really being interested in the subject, wanting to further this person's ideas, feeling like this is a worthwhile project, um, and I want to get it out in the world for people to read about. That's that's the most important thing, really. That's what I, I was actually going to ask you. My next question is, what is the psychic reward of being a ghostwriter? Uh, your name is not on the cover. Maybe you get some kind of acknowledgement inside in the acknowledgement section. Um, Yes, yeah, so there, I mean, usually the acknowledgement is written into your contract. If you're, if you're not on the cover, you are to have a nice acknowledgement. And often I think agents look at acknowledgements also to see who wrote this book, you know, so they get a, you get some sort of credit for that. But really it's the, you know, I mean, it has, the book has to be consonant with who you are. And I feel like, to me, it always resonates in my gut somewhere. I feel like, you know, I can do this one. I'm really interested in this one. I can spend a year or a year and a half on this. Other people come to me with ideas and it's like, no, nah, I don't think so. I'm just not there. I don't believe this. You know, it's not, <laughs> you know, I don't want to work with this person. I get a bad vibe from them. You know, maybe they're narcissists. Maybe they're, so there's some of that to actually navigate to be careful who you get married to because it's a marriage. Yes, we're going to talk about there about that. I, it, I it think it's like a marriage. Madeline, yeah. um, well, I, I, to pick up on what Susan was saying, I must be the world's biggest madame because I have plenty of writers who do it for the money. Okay, good. <laughs> and the so, money can be very good. Madeline, how does one become a ghostwriter or a collaborator? How do you either find an expert yourself 
or especially if you've never done it before, or how do you find an agent who can match you? It's very tough. It's the old, old thing. If you haven't done it, you know, it's really hard to do it. Nowadays, it has become so competitive. There are so many ghostwriters, collaborators out there as a result of, um, you know, all these journals, getting rid of employees, so many so many different forms of me media shedding, shedding their creative uh, writers. Um, I mean, my my writers, and I represent a lot of writers, they basically come from three streams. They're either former long form magazine journalists, former mid list authors, or former book publishing editors who either couldn't stand the corporate life any longer or got canned. To get into ghostwriting nowadays is really tough um, uh, because there are just so many writers out there. I mean, I would say it's the best of times and the worst of times, the best of times because there's more uh, freelance work than there ever has been, but the worst of times because there are more freelancers than there ever have been. You just have to keep plugging away. Uh, there's a very good um, publishing organ called Publishers Marketplace. And uh, you can take out a $25 a month subscription and that will give you a, a weekly and or a daily list, however you sign up, of all the books that have been that have been um, uh, sold by whom to whom. And I always think it's a very good investment for any writer because then they can track the kinds of agents and editors who are interested in whatever books are, are being sold. And and there's nothing to stop a freelance writer approaching one of these agents. And you're always better off approaching agents because 80% of books are packaged by the agents. And within Publishers Marketplace, you, you have the dedicated email address of whoever you want to approach as opposed to going through webmail. So that's a good way to start. When you're talking about Agent, you're talking about the authors or the experts agent, not not some I'm right literary agent. Literary agent. <laughs> what about approaching someone like you, who's sort of matchmaking between the writers, the ghostwriters and collaborators, and the author, the the person, the so expert? Somebody like me, did you say? Yeah. I at this stage of the game, I only represent writers who've been multiply published by the major houses. So unless you know, you have several books under your belt that have been put out by, you know, SNS or Penguin Random House or Macmillan or Hachette or HarperCollins, I'm probably not going to be able to help you because the way it's been set up now in publishing is whenever you um, uh, suggest writers, agents and or editors expect you to give uh, a list of several different writers who might be suitable for whatever the book is at hand. And so it becomes a beauty contest. So if if a writer who's never been published before, but you know maybe a great writer, but they've only done magazine articles, if they're competing against health writers who have several health books under their belt, their kind of chances are they're not going to make it. So you know, start small. Be prepared to do books for not that much money. There's certainly a lot of um, a huge amount of, of business in in the self publishing world nowadays, but that may be something you want to get onto later. I don't know. Um, what do you it, think of um, like a platform like Gotham Ghostwriters? Um, all I can say, I mean, Gotham started after me. I know Dan very well. He took me out for lunch one day years ago and said, how do you work? He used to be a speechwriter in those days. They're very they're different to me. So I would say 95% of my business is within the book publishing community. I come from a book publishing background. Whenever I put a list of writers together, I individually curate each list because I know all my writers. And basically nowadays I say I'm not in the book, in the publishing business, I'm in the relationship business. So for me, what is paramount is knowing my writers, you know, spending face time with them, preferably over a martini. Um, Gotham, I think 50%, I think Dan told me the other day that 50% of their business comes from publishers and 50% from 
uh, Pete Blue self-published, but they're much more of a clearinghouse. I mean, they say on their website, even they have something like over 3,500 writers. Whereas right. I, I, the way I understood it from their website is that an expert or somebody who wants to write a book or, or author a book will come to them, tell them the idea, and then Dan, the the website sort of puts out the idea to its world of registered that's writers who then send in pitches. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. Right. And then you kind of compete with all the right. writers registered so on the, the website. I work very differently. So the agent comes to me or the publisher comes to me and I give them a choice of four, six different writers from whom to choose. And I never tell my writers that I've done this until the agent or editor comes back and says, hey, we're really interested in whoever. Because otherwise, my phone would never stop ringing off the hook from anxious writers saying, so, so, you know, was so-and-so interested in me. So I do it the other way around completely. What so do you think? It goes to my writer and I say, oh, by the way, you know, I put your name forward for this particular project and they're interested in talking to you. Okay. Susan, what do you think about a writer who's never written a book and it's going to be tough to break into this field? who maybe has someone that they've interviewed in a magazine article or someone they think would be, you know, has great ideas, would make a great book. Going to that expert, uh, whether it's a physician or a scientist or researcher and, and, and saying, look, I want to collaborate with you. I think you have a book in you. Let's, let's together approach a literary agent. Is that a possible way for uh, someone who's never written a book before to maybe break in? Well, I don't know what, how it is today, but that is how I started, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wrote a, uh, an article about a, a professor at UCLA here, uh, and uh, that article got syndicated around the country. And about three weeks later, she called me and she said, you know, you did such a good job on the article. How would you like to write a book with me? So she actually came to me. And very stupidly, I said, sure, how hard could that be? <laughs> so I did learn how hard it was. Um, but yeah, I, I would advise that, uh, to come what as a package, maybe. What I would say is, uh, the whole marketplace has changed dramatically since yeah. when Susan was first, uh, approached. So yeah, in theory, not a bad idea at all, but an agent is only going to be interested if the author has quote unquote platform, i.e. they can bring a pre-existing audience to their book. So the first thing agents and editors do nowadays, almost before they look to see what the subject matter of the book is, is the size of their social media following, how many LinkedIn, how many Instagram, TikTok, whatever. Um, you know, do they have a regular magazine or, or television appearance, radio appearance, what have you? If you don't have any of that, it, it doesn't matter how qualified you are, the chances of getting your book published are pretty slim. Although now there is this other area of hybrid publishing where um, the the author becomes more of a partner with the publisher, so they don't get an advance, and sometimes they have to commit to buying back. I don't know, 10 or 15,000 copies of their books, but their book will be treated like a normal book. And in most cases, it'll get distributed through Ingram or Simon & Schuster, or, but that involves a considerable upfront investment uh, on the author's part, because not only do they have to pay to have the manuscript written, then they may also have to pay something in terms of buying back copies. And just to clarify, when you're talking about the author, you're talking about not the ghostwriter or the collaborator. Oh, sorry, yeah. So the author is the person who doesn't write, and the ghostwriter or the collaborator or the book doctor or the editor is the person who does write. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, well, actually, uh, one of our viewers has a question. Uh, I don't even know what this means. How is ghostwriting different from, quote, white label content? I have never heard of white label content. What does that mean? No, no idea. Okay. <laughs> um, let's talk about let's talk about the relationship. Uh, you've been matched with an expert, or you have found an expert who has a platform and seems like you know would be able to sell books. Um, how do you decide whether this is someone you want to be, Susan, as you said, married to for maybe a year? 
Uh, are there, what do you, what, what kinds of things do you want to make sure will happen? Susan, you want to start? Well, the first thing you want to make sure is that they don't think they can write the book themselves. Uh, because there are many experts who say, oh, I don't need a writer. I can do this myself. And what do you, you know, and so then there's a lot of resentment going forward constantly because they don't actually believe that they need you, even though the publisher may say that they do. So that that's a, that's a big red flag. Um, the other thing is just, uh, uh, you know, I'm an intuitive person. So I pick up vibes on people and I, I sort of get to see where they are and I spend time talking to them. Uh, the initial, introduction phone conversation let's say if Madeline refers somebody to me it can be more than an hour we spend a long time sort of talking about where we're coming from what the book might be about what they're looking for uh and I get a feel for whether or not first if I'm interested in the subject and secondly whether I feel comfortable working with them I did have some very difficult experiences at the beginning of my career I worked with one woman who was a narcissist and Oh my God. So, you know, I said to myself, I'm only writing books with my husband after this because <laughs> it was it was pretty tough. And that that took three, four books we did together. And then from there on, I got a very interesting project to work on and I came back to working with others. But I'm cautious now uh, and I sort of feel it out. Do you, uh, Marilyn, do you recommend that your writers meet with the authors in person? Well, they can, but, but in many cases, you know, the, the writer might be in Los Angeles, like Susan, for instance, and the and the author in New York. So then it's a Zoom, unless the author chooses to fly out the writer. But I, I but there's first normally they have a phone conversation with the literary agent, and then that goes to either meeting in person or having a Zoom conversation with the author. I think there are three flags really. The first one is I always get nervous when the agent says to me, well, we don't really know what the book is, but we know that the author and your ghostwriter will figure it out, which is a minefield because, you know, you can end up, if you're not careful, writing God knows how many uh, drafts of a proposal and it's only through endless realizing what you don't want that the, that the agent realizes what they do want. So we do try and and limit how many how many drafts of a proposal can be written. but that that's always that's always a big red flag. Then um, when you do meet people, even if you spend an hour with them, as, as Susan does, and even if you have a good instinct, you never know when it actually comes down to it. Because in many cases, these people have never written books. So they don't understand what it means. They don't understand the amount of work involved, et cetera. And they, and they probably have an ego. You don't know getting into this relationship, whether you're going to be working with somebody who's basically a control freak and has to almost approve every semicolon, even though we shouldn't use semicolons, or whether they are just, they regard you as being a sort of glorified secretary or a menuensis and just throw everything at you and say, you know, go and write the book. So you do have all those problems. And then it, there's this weird psychological shift that happens once the book has been written, suddenly, the author believes they wrote it all themselves. <laughs> I never forget, and it was a real learning lesson to me uh, ages ago when I sort of first started out. It was one of the first self-published books I ever did. We got the it was a business book, and and the manuscript was delivered, and and the writer and I met with the author, and I said to the author, "Well, this was a great book." great manuscript that, that Dave, my writer, wrote. And this man rose up to his full height. He said, what do you mean he wrote it? I wrote it. It's my book. And that was a lesson I've never forgotten. And there really is this, this strange sort of psychological shift that happens the closer you get to, to full delivery of, of, of the book. I, I imagine that's a reflection of a ghostwriter or collaborator doing a good job. If the author ends up thinking that they wrote it, I don't know. I don't think, I think so. You know, how, how do you guarantee the reflection of the author's ego? I, I spend a lot of, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yes, I spend time with my uh, potential co authors talking about process and talking about how we're going to construct this book uh, because I want them 
I want to adjust expectations, I guess, before we get into things. So my first words to them is that this is a collaborative process, which means that we're going to go through iterations. And that when I produce it, I take notes and I produce a draft for them based on what they gave me and the material they gave me. I expect for them to come back to me with corrections and things because I, you know, to me, it's a successive approximations. So we go over, but in advance of that, we agree on what's going to be in the book. We have an outline. We create the outline together. We propose the book together. Uh, we make those decisions about what's going into the book and how it's going to be presented. The, the proposal to me is much harder to do than the actual book because all of the decisions are made up front. And then from there, we can go with, okay, here's what we said we were going to do in chapter three. And we have all of those points and we can go through them one by one by one by one. Um, so that we're all prepared in advance, we know where we're going. And we don't get stuck in that morass of 10,000 different uh, uh, drafts, that's awful. Um, but I also know that, you know, it'll go back and forth a few times between me and the author. And then once we're happy, we turn around to the editor, and then it may go back and forth a couple of times with the editor as well. It's a collaborative process. Uh, How do you make sure that when you're going in that the person, especially if they're famous and have a big platform and are on social media and TV, have the time. Well, that's one of the yeah. problems that they don't that they don't necessarily have the time, that they squeeze you in. That can be a real problem. And particularly, you know, if you have if you have a delivery date to a publisher. When it comes to writing the proposal, it doesn't matter so much because it's a sort of self-imposed uh, delivery date. But uh, when it comes to delivering the book to a publisher, it can be a problem. So we always put in our contracts that um, for every day late that the author's late, the writer gets a day's extension. And I always encourage all my writers to sort of keep a, a diary, as it were, of, of what's going on. But, but one of the places where it becomes really unfair to a writer is, is if... Um, uh, an author is is really busy, and this can be a Hollywood celebrity or, or a leading physician, makes no difference. You know, the writer has put aside this time to write the book, either put aside, you know, say a couple of months or three months to write the proposal, or say nine months to a year to write the book, and suddenly the author kind of drops off the map because they've got so much else going on. The poor writer is left sucking their thumb. They can't take on another job. So they have this big space of time that they can't necessarily fill because they don't know when the author is suddenly going to reappear. And, and so from a from a, a, a time money point of view, it's 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 really problematic for the for the writer. I have a question from one of our viewers. How do you handle it when when some content of the book could use more research? Is that the uh, is did, does how do, they're giving you material? You've interviewed them, but uh, you feel them. You feel that more research needs to be done. I I don't think she means like research on the part of the writers, but research on the part of the author, backing up what the author is saying. I what do you think them. in that situation? I push them. We need more here. We need more here. Uh, so it's their responsibility to provide the content. So if the content is inadequate, then I have to push them. And, you know, the thing is, it's much easier to write a book when you have too much material than when you don't have enough. <laughs> and, uh, because then you're constantly digging for more, Hey, you know, you have to fill this out. It's not enough to write a chapter. Uh, but I have to push them then. And we need more. I'll say that not enough or yeah. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, an author can be persuaded to take on a researcher. But as a corollary to that question, I would say that I encourage, in fact, we try to put it in all our collaboration agreements nowadays, uh, that the that the ghostwriter uh, runs some kind of authenticate um, computer program on the manuscript before it's handed in which becomes the author's expense. It's only about $300 because, uh, you know, there was a big uh, case about uh, nine months ago of, of, of a lot of plagiarization on, on health books. And um, it became 
quite a cause celebre in, in book publishing. And with so much information out there nowadays, flying off the internet, you know, both from the writer's point of view and from the author's point of view, it's really hard to keep on top of where did you get all this stuff? And now you throw AI into the mix. So I really think it, it's in everybody's best interest to, to run some kind of computer uh, program to make sure that there is no uh, plagiarization. Because with a book publishing contract, uh, you know, both the writer and, and the author have to um, indemnify the publisher against plagiarization. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question about that later on when we get to contracts. Um, one person, one viewer is asking, uh, I've spoken to hybrid publishers who do just as your speaker says. Here's a kernel of an idea, but you two hash it out. Um, in your opinion, is that more common with hybrid publishers rather yes. than sort of the mainstream? It's what? more common. Uh, coming to a writer, and saying, I have an author, uh, here, here's a kernel of an idea, you two flesh it out together. You know, um, well, the, the author better have a lot of money because A, they're going to be paying for the uh, manuscript to be written as opposed to getting an advance from a publisher. They're going to be fronting the money for, for, the, for, the, for the book to be written. And then they may also have to buy back copies of the book from from the from the hybrid publisher and they don't want them sitting in the garage okay another question is again on process um what do you do if an author that you're collaborating or you're ghostwriting for has a third person like a family member or a spouse or somebody who wants to vet everything oh. um has that ever happened yeah. to you not to me no Okay. Yeah, whatever they do on their side, they keep to their side. So I'm not answerable to somebody's spouse or, or brother-in-law, whatever. That's their business. If they come back to me and say, hey, you know, I've been thinking about it. Maybe we should do this and this and this. I'll, I'll make a case for yes or no. I don't think so. Or, you know, but I, I'm not involved with anybody else except for the author. I'm, I'm... But the problem is that if the author is doesn't really, isn't, isn't really is, is is little insecure about what they're doing, and they show yeah. it to their spouse or their parents or their best friends, all these various people. They always feel that whatever comment they make, it has to be intelligently negative for some reason, as opposed to just saying <laughs> this is fantastic, you know. And so, yeah, it can become a real a real headache. Okay, who I just who secures the publisher? Is that the literary agent for the? author, you know, the expert or the scientist or researcher or psychologist, or whoever you may be working with. I'm sorry, who does Who secures what? the publishing contract? Who, who? Oh, who reviews the publishing? The, the author's agent. Okay. So there are two different contracts. There's the, there's the contract that the author has with the book publisher, which is, which is negotiated by their literary agent. And, and in ninety nine percent of the of of, of of the occasions, the ghostwriter does not appear. The publisher may agree to add the ghostwriter on their their errors and omissions policy, which is a you know insurance policy against getting sued by somebody else. But the but the ghostwriter is not privy to the publisher's contract. And then there's a separate collaboration agreement between the author the author, care of their agent, and the ghostwriter, care of me or whomever they happen to work with. That's what I want to talk to next about next, actually, is, is the contract and the money. <laughs> so if, if you're a ghostwriter, you're not get on the cover, you're, you're, you know, you're not getting that kind of credit, um, you sign a contract with the author that you're ghostwriting for, it's facilitated by let's say someone like you, Marilyn, um, what can you expect in a contract like that? Are you paid a flat fee? Do you get any of the royalties? What kind of pay, what does the payment look like? In most cases, it's a flat fee. Very few books pay royalties. So frankly, I'm more interested in getting the larger upfront. Sometimes what I do is I'll ask a writer, what's the guaranteed minimum they need? 
and then uh, I'll do a deal with the agent that, that the writer gets a guaranteed minimum or or a certain percentage of the author's um, earnings, whichever is greater. Um, often the agent will try and cap that a certain amount. So I do I do try that and get pushed back from quite a few agents on that one. But um, that's, that's, you know, I, I think taking less to get to get a, a, a royalty, unless you're working with Peter, uh, Peter Atiyah, you know, it's probably not a right. modest go. Now, well, there are a couple of things that, that uh, just going back to this cover credit thing, um, a lot of writers now get title page credit. So I quite often ask for title page credit. And that's easier to get because, and it's good to have because then you still, your name still appears in all the meta, in all the meta stuff like on Amazon and if it gets on the bestseller list. Um, and the most important thing from my point of view is that the, and I always put this in all our contracts, is that the writer be able to put the book on their on their publishing resume because that's what goes out to the agents and the and the editors. But if you're a ghostwriter, isn't the whole idea that it appears that the author did it themselves? No, but when it's on your publishing resume, that's that's how you get more business. But what's what gets put on the title page if you're getting credit on the title oh. page? Well, if you get credit on the credit page, that's that's sort of a step down from getting cover credit but it's better a step up from just getting what we call a generous acknowledgement but whatever whatever it is whether you get cover credit title page credit or or generous acknowledgement you should always negotiate in a contract that you can put it on your professional resume susan what can uh, you say you, you, writers have to expect to spend a year or so on a book project perhaps what can you get paid and can you work on other journalism projects at the same yes. time? Yes. So, you know, my my habit for many years was to be landing one book while I was taking off with another one. And that there are big spaces in the book publishing business where, you know, you've turned the book in and it's gone to copy edit and you've got a month or so. So you can work on something else in the meantime. And and Madeline also, or my other agents have put in my contract that even though I'm working on this book, I can also take on other projects as long as it doesn't interfere with the one in question. So, you know, when it comes to having three or four books going on at the same time, I found that was my limit. That was a bit much, uh, but you know, it happened. And I said, okay, that's not going to happen again. It's just too stressful, but you know, it is possible to work other material in as you're going along. It is because there are these big gaps and even, you know, I would send, let's say the first three or four chapters to the editor, to the publisher really, the publisher's editor, just for approval, is the tone right? You know, are we, are we attacking the problem the way that you expected? And so they may take two months before they get back to me. And so again, I can turn to something else in the meantime while I'm waiting. So it's, it's a, yeah, it is possible, definitely. What can a writer expect to make, to earn on a book? I think that that varies widely. And, uh, you know, when I first started out, I would be paid for the proposal, let's say $5,000 or $10,000. And it was included then <laughs> when I got paid later, they would subtract that off. Like we paid you this already, oh. right? Oh, <laughs> so that was so good. But over time, as I, you know, gained more experience, I've said, no, actually I get to keep whatever it is that it, because that's time spent and uh, it's difficult time spent. So I keep whatever they pay me to write the proposal and then, uh, or the outline, and then we go on from there. It could be, I mean, there were years where I was making $100,000 a year from this kind of work. And then there were years when I was making $30,000 a year. And of course, you know, if you're paying uh, quarterly installments, your next year's taxes based on last year's income, but you don't have any income this year. <laughs> so, you know, you have to really juggle a little bit and pay attention. And sometimes I'll ask to be paid, you know, we're coming up on December. I'm not just about done. You know, can you pay me next year? So it doesn't get, it doesn't get uh, counted into my taxes for this year. And I, you know, it's, it's a thing, but I also, you know, I always get paid on signing a portion 
and I always get paid. Uh, it's usually three installments for me. I get paid when I turn in the first draft of the manuscript. And then I get paid when the book is accepted and goes and goes to to print. Uh, some people get paid a year after the book comes out. Uh, to me, that's too long to wait. I, you know, but it, it depends. It really depends on the individual. Marilyn, can you give a range of what your authors would make on writing a book with an author? Oh, I mean, no. what writers make in writing a book with an author. Incidentally, my name's Madeline, not Marilyn. But on health, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, on uh, health, we're talking specifically health books here, right? Um, I would say the range, the range that my writers get, uh, it's probably on average about a hundred thousand. So say between seventy thousand and a hundred and fifty. I have one writer now who's doing book. She got paid two hundred thousand, but that's top end and and also for a, a, a very high high profile um uh medical person um and then for a proposal i guess i, I think the average is about twelve and a half thousand dollars for a full length proposal in a sample chapter and that's non-recoupable and publishers get uh, and agents are, are getting very tough about payouts nowadays and it's causing tremendous amount of anguish amongst all writers so normally you get paid 50% of your money is due on on uh, signature contract and receipt of the monies by the author now the problem nowadays is from the time that you have a verbal uh, the, from the time that the, lit, the author's literary agent has a verbal deal with the publisher to the time you have a fully executed contract you're looking minimum two months and then another month before they get paid so the writer may have to wait for three months till they get their on signing payment meanwhile they have a, a book that maybe has to be delivered in six to nine months and they haven't been paid for three months and so that become that creates a real cash crunch it creates resentment I spend my life yelling at literary agents. They spend their lives yelling at the contracts people and at the financial people. And this is the way it's been set up now by the publishers because they're all owned by major corporations and they all want to hold on to their money for as long as possible because, you know, it's better that it goes to the shareholder. And then at the back end, you have the same thing again. You know, you can deliver the manuscript. It's very hard, I find, nowadays to get monies on... on uh, uh, delivery of a draft manuscript I sometimes get that but most of these agents won't do it now in fact they'll they want to spin it out more and more so there's often on on D, what we call DNA which is delivery and acceptance and that those monies can take again up to uh you know several months to for those monies to come through because uh, the manuscript has to be edited there has to be copy edited it has to have its legal reading and basically the monies are released when the when the book is about to go off to the printer and then very often there is a payment tied unfortunately to to publication and now more and more they're trying to spin it out to paperback publication as well so it you know goes on into the middle distance and it's a constant fight uh, one of our viewers says that she was approached or he was approached about writing a book, but offered payment only after publishing, nothing at all up front upon signing. Is that, that's not typical? No. Not only not typical, not wise. <laughs> not wise. <laughs> not wise. Right. You never know where it's going to go. No. They, they yeah, have to have some you know, Obviously game. somebody said to him, oh, you know, we're partner on this, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the chat, you know, uh, there's some commentary about, you know, how all of us as freelancers are tough and we're used to competition and, you know, pitching our article ideas to editors. Um, and so, you know, the idea that this is tough to break into is is not necessarily a turnoff, but is there, are there one or two key bullet points you would advice you would offer to journalists who have never written a book before and want to break in in this uh, environment get a great cv 
uh, try and get endorsements uh, to the quality of your work from as many uh, pe people and you know trade people as you can. Uh, develop a, a really terrific uh, website, preferably have somebody do it for you as opposed to some, you know, granola homegrown thing. So you look like you're a professional. And then just, you know, blanket, blanket as many people as you can, letting them know you're out there. And, you know, if you throw enough mud at the wall, eventually something will stick. Okay. May not be very well paid initially, but it'll be a step in the door. Susan, any advice for the first time? Well, first I'm just again? thinking back. Um, it's, you know, one of the old conundrums. If you don't have an agent, you can't get an agent. <laughs> um, and of course, times are different now than when I started in the 80s. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, when I, I would pitch myself to not just people like Madeline, but also literary agents, because they too have stables of writers and they sometimes will get an author who has a terrific idea, but can't develop it. And you can be part of their stable. They could call on you as well. Um, and I've had a few books come my way that way uh, with other agents. So quite a few actually. Um, but again, you have to get in front of them. You have to get their attention. There's, they need to be able to feel like they can trust you. Right. Uh, which goes back to what I was saying about signing on to Publishers Marketplace where, you know, you can see who the agents are. And one thing I actually advise uh, ghostwriters is never sign exclusively with any agent because if you do, there are going to be an awful lot of arid periods in, in, in your career, probably. You should just try and do a deal whereby the agent represents you on the book that they that they uh, you know got for you but that they don't seem own you body and soul right okay is there an association or an online community of ghostwriters or collaborators that uh people should be aware of i think there's a there's a facebook i'm pretty sure there's a facebook community um i don't know what it's called people would have to research it um, and I think there is another ghostwriters community. Um, what's her name? Marsha Turner, I believe, is her name. Okay, Susan, any thoughts on that? I'm not, okay. I'm I'm a lone wolf. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, yeah, not part of any organization. Okay. There's a question here. I don't know if you can address it, but. Um, a lot of times when freelance journalists do work for, let's say. Uh, like content work, for instance, um, for a university or for a corporation, there's always the ethical issue. Um, how does this, how do I wall that off from my journalism um, so that there's no conflict of interest? But I'm not sure if that would apply when working on a book. Um, right. You have to worry about that. I think if you feel there's a conflict of interest, you just keep it to yourself. Who's going to know? Okay. So well, is I, you know, the first book that I wrote was for the general public, but my partner was uh, a professor at UCLA trying to get her tenure. And so she was using a lot of her research in the book itself. I see no reason why she couldn't have done that. That's I don't, that's not a conflict of interest. She was actually hoping to get tenure from the book, but she, as a, as a uh, book for the general public, it wasn't suitable. So in fact, no, uh, it didn't help her in her career, but it, you know, got the word out about her ideas and, and her research. Okay, so, I'm seeing in the chat function that people are mentioning the Association of Ghostwriters. And someone says there are two membership levels and associate associate is fairly inexpensive. I think that's the Marsha Turner. Marsha. Yeah. yeah, that's what they said. Um, getting back to contracts, should let's say you, you're lucky enough to get that far and you have a contract, you're a writer, you have a contract with an author to ghostwrite or collaborate. Uh, I assume you should show it to a lawyer. Well, in my case, I have somebody who does all my contracts for me. Uh, okay. You know, and-, and Your she, writers don't have to separately show it to a lawyer. No, you're, uh, you're helping with yeah, that. The authors, the authors do. Uh, and uh, the, the authors do it if they, if they're Holly, if they come from Hollywood, then you have all these ghastly LA 
attorneys, you know, who crawl all over the contracts and take forever to do it and are too lazy to use track changes. But no, uh, no, I mean, the, the person who does all my contracts, she used to be the contracts person at Random House and Hyperion, so she knows everything. I mean, if you want to use your uh, an attorney, by all means, but it's not really, it's it's really not necessary, I don't think. I think that for me, I used an attorney maybe for my first or second book. And then after that, I realized that the agent really has vetted the contract completely. But it is the job of the of the writer to read the contract and make sure they understand all of the clauses of the contract. And if they don't understand indemnification or other sort of difficult clauses, they need to ask the agent, hey, what does this mean? What does it mean to me? What happens if X, Y, or Z? But I, the agents are experts in this, and I rely on them. I mean, okay. if you don't have an agent, then maybe you should uh, have a, an attorney look at it. But you want yeah. a publishing attorney. You don't want an attorney who, who's experienced in widgets. Because um, how do you find an attorney who's experienced in this area? Literary attorney. It's it's called the intellectual properties attorney. Okay, they exist. Okay, and in LA I, for sure. <laughs> if you're uh, very expensive, by the way, exceedingly. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, if you are, let's say, a ghostwriter, you've signed an agreement with the author. You're being paid a flat fee, relying on their research and the information they give you. Can you, as the ghostwriter, be sued by someone who doesn't like what's in the book? Yeah. Or is that just the author who's you like? Can, okay, so the way it works is the author indemnifies the ghostwriter uh, on content, and the ghostwriter indemnifies the author against plagiarization any plagiarization that the writer may have may have created or and they also indemnify them against any kind of breach of the contract but ultimately it's it's really when it comes to content it's really the the, the onus is on the author does that mean to say you can't be sued no i mean people sue this is america you know everybody sues everybody ridiculous Susan, can you just, um, we're going to wrap it up, but can you just tell me one of the books that you enjoyed working on the most as a co-author or, or collaborator or ghost? Hard well, to say there are like, like babies, you know, do you love one of your babies more than the other? Not exactly. Some are harder, more difficult to deal with, uh, but they're all your little children that come out. And, you know, it used to be I would push a book out and then start on the next one and uh, while I'm working on the one that I am, it's it's, it's a hundred thousand piece puzzle. I love doing puzzles. I put all the pieces together uh, to create an argument. I love the process of it. I don't just, you know, again, it's not just the content, but it's I I like organizing and and you know pulling ideas together and making and you know for a journalist who's working on a newspaper article or a magazine article, you're wearing a really tight girdle. I mean, you've got us cram a whole lot into a few column inches or, you know, a thousand words or 2,500 words. Here you've got 75,000 words. You can go at it. You know, you can have full reign uh, to to make a good argument and, and to make a difference in the world, to help people, which is really what I my books are all about. Uh, in the chat, someone mentioned that membership in the Authors Guild includes as a benefit that one of their legal team will review a free contract review. Uh, I think you're right, yes. That's correct. Madeline, last question for this session. Um, tell me, what are there some key characteristics that are essential for a writer to have who's going to be doing this work? Well, I always facetiously say high pain threshold and no ego. <laughs> but they also have to they also have to be curious, very curious. And and the one thing I would I I, I would uh, say because it would be of interest to everybody the books the in in the health field and medical field nowadays that publishers are really interested in are the ones that are really based in science so really the books that have a really solid um you know underpinning the, the days of you know some starlets guide to how to be you know, how to improve your health unless you're you know a major starlet 
publishers aren't interested in those anymore. They want the books that are really, you know, have a solid foundation. Okay. I want to thank everyone who tuned in. If you joined us late, you will find the recording of this webinar um, at healthjournalism.org in a few hours. And I wanna thank both um, Madeline and Susan, our panelists for uh, sharing their expertise with us. It was terrific. And uh, thank everyone for watching and for asking great questions and uh, good luck with your future books. Thank, thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Yes, been a pleasure. It was fun. <laughs>